Hi there and welcome to the Infosys Awards show to the Science and Society debate. The Infosys Awards are in their fifth year this year. These awards have been instituted to recognize excellence in the pure sciences and in the social science. The question is, is India building enough capacity in the pure sciences and in the higher humanities to create human capital for progress and for change? To discuss whether India is doing enough to bring its scientists back to the country, we are very privileged to have on this show Chris Gopalakrishnan, Executive Vice Chairman of Infosys and Trustee of Infosys Science Foundation. Uh, Dr. Inder Verma, you are Professor at the Salk Institute and you are also the Jury Chair for the Infosys Prize in Life Sciences. We have Professor Rahul Pandhari Pandey, you are Professor of ETH Zurich and winner of the Infosys Prize 2013 in Mathematics. Congratulations. And we also have Professor P. Balram, Director of the Indian Institute of Science in Bangalore. Thanks everyone very much indeed for being here. Chris, at the very outset, let me put to you, is it true to say that scientists are not coming back? Because I have a report here written by Raghu Kumar, who is himself an NRI, who returned to India, who says that due to global meltdown and visa restrictions, 500 scientists have in fact returned in the last seven years, and only seven have gone back. So when we're saying scientists are not coming back, are we also actually looking at a situation where some scientists are in fact coming back, and there is a bit of a reverse brain drain happening? Sure. Um, there are a few scientists who are coming back. In fact, uh, there are few non-resident Indians who are coming back actually because the environment in India has changed. We have an economy that's growing faster than the rest of the world. We have significant investments going into um, science, engineering, education in general. So there are people who are returning at this point. They are returning because conditions have changed. Uh, Dr. Verma, do you believe conditions have changed? Because I want to quote to you the views of Venkatraman Ramakrishnan, the Nobel laureate of 2009, who is now at the University of Cambridge, who says, and I can quote, we should give a lot of autonomy from bureaucracy, from red tape, from local politics to scientists so they can come back. What scientists like to do is science and not politics. Do you agree with that? I think on balance in principle, yes. And scientists will come back to India just like any other place because if you create the right conditions for them to work, if you give them the opportunity to give the very best equipment, the resources, finances to be able to do what they want to do, they will come back. And there are people coming back. But I don't think it's due to global meltdown they're coming back. I speak now of life sciences. Mm -hmm. In life sciences, very often people tend to come back many times for family reasons and some who are coming back are not necessarily the one you necessarily would want to have because they have not succeeded in the United States or other countries because of difficulty right. to raise funds but that is not a good criteria to come back. No. I think you want to attract people A who are top scientists but most important for them is be able to do the best research because you offer them the opportunity and the conditions to do that. I think that's the biggest criteria. The for opportunity research. to do the best research. Thursday Rahul, time. is that why someone like you, for example, you're based in Zurich, would you consider coming back or do you feel that, as Dr. Verma is saying, you won't get the opportunities to do the kind of research that you're doing? So there, in, in India, in mathematics, there are some uh, very strong centers. Mm -hmm. And uh, there, are there, there are people who are... Are there enough and are they big enough? Probably for the size of the country, there's probably um, there could not be enough. More. Could be more. Yes. Could be more. Yeah. But what would draw you to to come back to India if if, if you were inclined, or are you not inclined? Uh, I think it, it, it what has been said already that there should be a, an environment where there are very good students, there's support for research. In my field in mathematics, it's already a uh, field that's relatively easy to carry out wherever you are in the world because it requires more good internet connections, access to information, not. Uh, um, not like life sciences where you need a lot of infrastructure. But uh, still one needs an a, a institute with students and support for... One needs uh, an institute with students. Uh, Professor Balrama, that's an in interesting point I want to pick up on because it's often been said that the science institutes in India, like the Indian Institute of Science, or say like the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research, these are not teaching institutions. You know, these are pure science institutions. They're not attached to a university. They're not part of the university ecosystem. So they're not linked to students and in the West science is happening at the universities. Here science is happening in these institutes. Is that a problem with India that these institutes of excellence are detached from the universities? 
It is true that the advanced institutes have a greater emphasis on PhD degrees. Mm -hmm. There are probably more graduate students in the Indian Institute of Science or TIFR than in say a typical American university where you would have a very large undergraduate population. But I think there is still a is lot there, of... Is that a problem? Would you, do you wish that it was different? That, that the science institutes were much more part of a university ecosystem? I think it would be nice to have an institution in which you had uh, young students uh, doing bachelor's degrees in addition to students who were doing uh, graduate work which is one reason why we have started an undergraduate program over right. the last three years. Right. Uh, Chris, you know, it's often said about India that we don't give pride of place to scientists, that the role of the scientist is not recognized in society, that society doesn't recognize the scientist. But on the other hand, the recipient of the Bharat Ratna uh, this year is CNR Rao, who in fact is the uh, former director of the Indian Institute of Science and also is at the Jawaharlal Nehru Institute of Advanced Studies right here in Bangalore. So. Is it true to say any more that India doesn't recognize its scientists, that India is not doing well by its scientists? We instituted the Infosys uh, Science Foundation crisis, Infosys Science crisis, because of this reason, that we need to, in India, recognize uh, good work that is being done, world-class work being done, and, and the stature of the prize must be such that it is a world-class prize. So mm -hmm. if you look at the jury chairs, they are all people of uh, great um, eminence uh, anywhere in the world actually. They are internationally known scientists and they are the people who are picking the winners for Infosys Science Prize. Uh, the situation is changing. There is recognition that uh, uh, you know, these scientists are doing great work and they need recognition and as you said, uh, the Bharat Ratna is mm -hmm. another indication of that. But of course, we need more of these. We need more number of people um, entering these fields, looking at science as a career and looking at research as more importantly, research as a career. Right. And, 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 and Dr. Varma, to, to attract world-class uh, scientists to India, is the government doing enough? Uh, there are, I know that there is the uh, Ramanujan Fellowship, there's a Ramalinga Swami Fellowship, there's the Inspire program. Uh, is the government doing enough to bring world-class talented scientists back? Scientists don't come back or don't work because they want recognition. Mm -hmm. Scientists do things because they are excited about discovery. They want to find new things, something which hasn't been done. And therefore, they will like to do these things where they have resources and colleagues where they can count on them. So that's why I think that's more important for the scientists than recognition. It's nice to get recognition. That's but a very that interesting is, point. But that, that is, is not, not the just motivation. It's about recognition. It's yeah. also about the, having the like-minded people around, Absolutely. people to talk to, the right kind of talent around. Giving a fellowship is a good idea, but that's not what is going to make a difference. What is going to make a difference is what kind of an institution is there where people will be able to do their research. Right. So it's not just the institu it's not just the fellowship, it's the institution. Absolutely. And when you're talking about institution, you're talking about institution builders. And you need people who can actually build institutions. Just take the question for biological sciences. The best Indian scientists who want to come back, where do they want to go? They want to go to IISC mm -hmm. in Bangalore, Dr. Ram's institution. They want to go to NCBS. They want to go to NII. Just as in the United States, people would go to MIT, Harvard, Stanford, and other places. People right. want to go with the best. So if you create many more such institutions, more people will come back. Right. These institutions so the number of institutions are still too small. A, and the second thing is there is really a dearth of what I call scientific leadership. Professor Balram, when you look at the great Homi Bhabha, Vikram Sarabhai, the great institution builders in science, you're heading a great institution, you're an institution builder. But are people like you rare? Are, are institution builders in science in India rare? At the time when Homi Bhabha or Bhatnagar built institutions, mm -hmm. India was really in the building phase. You must remember that we went through a very long period from the 60s all the way to the 90s uh, where there was very little money for uh, uh, scientific research. I think this pickup in science is a much more recent phenomenon which is post-liberalization. Mm -hmm. uh, so now there is a lot of funding. It's still a little too early to uh, uh, worry about the present situation. The current level of funding 
should be maintained and should grow steadily over the next few years. I want to pick up on the point though about again the institution builders and the bureaucratization of the bureaucracy in the red tape. Does that does that still say don't someone like you that when you come back to India you will face red tapeism and, and, and bureaucracy and and, and, and and you won't have that kind of autonomy. Is, is that is that the kind of uh, uh, stereotype about India if you like that continues? I don't have continues? personal experience with it so I don't know. You don't but is that is that how perhaps scientists in your generation think about India? It, um, I, I, so my experience is with the U.S., and, and mm -hmm. it is the case that the amount of uh, bureaucracy varies from different, from private right. to to, uh, to government institutions, and in Europe, it also varies a lot. But it is very important for scientists to. It is be very important. A place where I no also want to pick them. up on what uh, on what Dr. Verma was saying about it's not just about funding, it's not just about uh, having the institutions, it's also about having the right kind of people. Yeah having the right colleagues, having the right people to talk to. Is that what you would miss in India? Yes, yeah, so that, that is true. I mean, the, the centers in, in, the Euro, in Europe and the U.S. have a really fantastic collection of people. I mean, yeah, how, how do we get over that problem, to create that collection of people? It will take time. I mean, again, mm -hmm. why is Indian Institute of Science so successful? Mm -hmm. They have not just biology, they have chemistry, physics, mathematics, computer engineering. Now, biological sciences is heavily dependent on those areas. Mm -hmm. Therefore, many institutions which did not build like the IISCs don't have the same advantages. Right. I understand the government is, or is building many new institutions. I know one in Pune, which is uh, they're called now, ISERS? ISA. And they seem to be building in a very much in the mold of bringing different disciplines together. Mm -hmm. And I think that's very attractive to scientists, to be able... To have different disciplines, disciplines together. together. Is that what you are working on at the Indian Institute of Science as well, having different disciplines? Yes, it's quite clear now that uh, it's difficult to do cutting-edge science unless you have collaborations with people across disciplines. So I think science has become extremely interdisciplinary in nature. Right. Some sciences even more than others. Uh, biology... How interesting. Can you give us some examples of, uh, of that? How do we uh, look at this new interdisciplinary trend in science? I can mention one area which is growing, for example, at the Indian Institute of Science, the area of neuroscience. Right. Now, in the area of neuroscience, the faculty whom we have recruited, uh, many of them have bachelor's degrees in engineering. They've graduated from the IITs, right. gone to the best places in America, and then come back here. They've left India as engineers and returned as neurobiologists. Mm -hmm. And I think you require people with backgrounds in computer science and physics uh, to get into this area. Right. And uh, I think neuroscience, areas like research on energy, for instance, today requires people from all the disciplines to work together. Right. So it's the interdisciplinary nature of science, which is important, is not just about funding, it's not just about autonomy, it's about having that collection of people and like-minded intellectuals and researchers and scientists who can inspire each other and spur each other on for more work. Let's take a short break at this point and come back and talk about the role of the private sector or what can be done on the part of the government to in fact facilitate more and more scientists coming back and to actually make these institutions truly world class and globalized. That's after the break. Welcome back to the Infosys Awards show, the Science and Society debate. We're talking about the Infosys Awards, which have been instituted to recognize excellence in the pure sciences and in the social sciences, and asking what can India do to bring back its world-class scientists to the country. Chris, we were talking in the break about the role of the private sector. What can the private sector do? There have been endowments. You yourself have made an endowment to the Indian Institute of Science. Uh, Azim Premji has made an endowment. Uh, Shiv Nader has started his uh, university. What is the role of the private sector? So there are multiple things private sector can get involved. One is um, sponsor research, sponsored projects. Second is sponsoring the, uh, the individuals themselves, you know, setting up chairs and things like that. Third, of course, is setting up the whole um, university, whole research facility. Fourth, which is also, I believe, very, very important, is to actually take the output from these institutions and build industries around this, build businesses around it, take the ideas to the market, look at startup uh, Interesting. In, and entrepreneurship and things so like that. So create that, that repertoire of science which can have a practical application for industry. And these in are the, the people when they become successful 
who will actually fund their alma mater back. Uh, Dr. Verma, you were saying you wanted to also speak about the role of philanthropy and, and how so, that can be of crucial importance. My own institution has a budget of 100 million a year, mm -hmm. of which 55 million comes from private philanthropy. Mm -hmm. Because that is the funding that allows you to do cutting edge research. So I think to me it's very heartening and Chris being one such example to be able to support in this case the neuroscience institution that you described right. before which really is groundbreaking. Mm -hmm. There's just this kind of infusion of funds will allow us to bring people back of the highest quality because they will be able to work A, we're not worrying about getting funds, mm -hmm. and B, they have the opportunity to bring another bunch of colleagues with them to build a center. Uh, Chris, just to uh, come back to that endowment, it's an impressive endowment that you've made to the uh, Indian Institute of Science. Uh, do you believe that you're a rarity? Because, you know, Indian industrialists don't really make endowments to educational institutions. They don't really do this kind of philanthropy. Why is that? Actually, it is not, you know, because if you look at uh, Indian Institute of Science itself, it was set up from uh, a fund that that has created. Mm -hmm. So, um, and, and many of the large institutions were created with uh, support from uh, uh, industrialists, in, especially in the pre-independence era actually, mm -hmm. and maybe through the 60s. It's really between the 60s and the 90s. I think we, we lost out quite a bit, uh, where, uh, you know, we had a different uh, uh, environment in India and the mm -hmm. taxations was very high, so the wealth creation was not happening in India. Mm -hmm. I think that situation, I hope, will change uh, and, and definitely as the uh, Indian um, businesses become large, become international and the need for supporting right. research for the future of their own companies, I mm -hmm. think, become all the right. more important right. because innovation is what is going to drive mm -hmm. growth in the future. Mm -hmm. Professor Balram, do you agree that, that industry is, is waking up to the fact that there is a hopeful future, that there should be more philanthropy, there should be more endowments made uh, by industrialists to universities and to institutes of excellence? I think individuals and foundations created by very successful uh, entrepreneurs are in fact now engaged with academic institutions. My own institution has uh, received grants from a mm -hmm. foundation, the Bosch Foundation, for work in cyber physical systems. Right. And this was the first time that uh, grant was given really for what you might call research which is open-ended. Mm -hmm. There may be an application somewhere down the line. But it wasn't given with the purpose of feeding back into the industry. Is there a kind of squeamishness on the part of the institutes of higher excellence towards accepting endowments from business? Because I, I was a student at Oxford and, you know, it was very acceptable to have the Nissan professor of, uh, of history or the Kellogg professor of sociology. It's still, you know, there seems to be on the part of the academic elite a kind of squeamishness that, oh, we can't have a chair endowed by, you know, a business house. No, I don't think that's true anymore. Right. I think uh, in pre-1990s era, <laughs> Uh, in India, it was generally felt that making money was bad form. Yeah. And uh, I think everything's changed. Is that something that has to change? That, that mental block that academics have or that the pure academics have about business, about, about the need to interface with industry and the need to create institutes of excellence with endowments from industry? So, you know, I have close interaction with right. IIT Madras, which is my alma mater, I, Indian Institute of Science, and I am Bangalore. And I have not found that, actually. Uh, institutes are gaining more confidence. When you say Oxford, you're talking a 400-year-old institution. Right. <laughs> so our institutions are gaining enough confidence that they can withstand right. the pressures that they might have thought been put onto them by industry. So they have, now I think it's a much more acceptable because they are willing to understand what is required of them in return. And this just coming out of that socialist puritanism or whatever it was of the early years of independence, I, I, I guess. don't know, I didn't work here, so I won't know. Where was your first uh, degree, if I can ask you? If my, actually, I started an Indian Institute of Science in Bangalore. Oh, you did, you but I, started but the I left started and, institute. But I left to, to do my PhD actually at the Weizmann Institute right. in Israel. Then I right. went to MIT. So do you see a big difference? Do you see the, tra the, the transition from when you, when you were oh, here yes, yes. Uh, you to know, now? Oh, it's very different. Right. It's very different. Our students now can stand up and ask questions and talk to professors. The teachers are now much more 
on an on a path to right. treat the students as equal. It's a very different structure. It now. is a very different oh, structure. It's, and it's very hopeful structure. And was it different before? You were saying that they oh, can yes. ask questions, but they were not allowed to ask questions. I can questions tell you when I was a student in biochemistry <laughs> department, you didn't ask questions. <laughs> Professor <laughs> Sarma, who was the head of the department, you asked a question, he gave you a piercing look, you were done. <laughs> <laughs> I, I hope you don't do that. You give a piercing look to a student. That's how I felt. Ask you that's how I felt. <laughs> that, that's left for your viewers to judge. <laughs> <laughs> You're giving me a lot of piercing looks and I'm asking you those questions. Rahul, I, I, you know, is, is, that, is that again, I come down to it, a difference you see in India that, uh, that uh, people here don't have that confidence to take on established wisdom, to take on their teachers. Is that, is that what you perhaps would miss if you came, when you interact with, say, scientists here or mathematicians here? Do, do, do you get that sense at all? In the mathematical centers and the people I interact with, I don't get that sense. Right. I will say about the, the uh, philanthropy, the, the best institutions in the U.S., it's, it's common that half their funding budgets come from the, the effects of years of, of, of private philanthropy, and it gives mm -hmm. a lot of freedom. As a scientist and mathematician, is that what you value most? The it's freedom. A, it's to a freedom is very important. Not yeah. having to be, not having to listen to other people, to to, to be control of the scientists. Scientists who work on some some direction, they feel they, they know what to do in that direction. They don't they don't need someone telling them what to do. Right, uh, and it allows people to reinvent themselves. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you get into a rut because right. of the funding, your known quantity. People fund you on that area, but if you want to reinvent yourself, like, for example, in biological sciences, mm -hmm. computer sciences are becoming an important component for data analysis. Mm -hmm. If you want to change yourself, this kind of funding that we just heard allows you the freedom to do new things. Right. And uh, so just on balance, Professor Balram, things are not so bad in India then. You're saying the funding is there. Questioning is there. You don't give your students piercing looks. Uh, there, there is some amount of autonomy. Uh, you're saying no. You're saying you're saying something very important. You're saying that actually the situation is not as bleak in India in terms of science at all. I've been in India for the last 40 years doing right. research, and uh, I so wish I were 40 years younger. Right. And I could start all over again because it's never been uh, this good. as positive <laughs> as uh, it is today. Yeah. That's great. That's, that's wonderful. So, you know, I would say situation has changed, but we need more. Right. So, you know, for a country of our size, uh, we need more such institutions. We need more research being done in India. We need to attract more people to come back to India. Mm -hmm. Some are coming, but that's not sufficient. Right. So how do we scale this up? How do we uh, that increase? That remains the challenge. Yes. And I think you can't escape the fact that we have, look at China for example, mm -hmm. it's incredible amount of progress in life sciences mm -hmm. they have done in the last 10-15 years. And this is by attracting the diaspora They have back. done very well in attracting the diaspora mm -hmm. for a variety of social reasons perhaps right. which are different than India. And but that they have has, done that. And, that. and what has that done now is that has built a nucleus mm -hmm. which now allows many others to go back independent of the high degree of financing they got originally. Now the new ones who are going back are going because of the great institution to work. Is there okay. a great institution in India that you would like to, to return to, uh, I, hypothetically? Well, let me first say about the, the, the Chinese. In mathematics, it's also happening in the US and in right. Europe. You see, it's, this is maybe the first generation of, of top-level people returning to China. And there's been new institutes made there. And uh, there's a, a, a supply of students that's... But you're not answering the call of the ah, motherland, are you? No. Is there, th <laughs> so there are some, uh, th yeah. there are institutes in India where top-level mathematics is done. It's, uh, but it, it is not the same. Uh, I mean, the, the For the moment, you're happy in yeah. Zurich. <laughs> well, that's, that's, that, that, that points up the fact that India has achieved a great deal in its institutes of excellence. And these institutes are getting there. They are attracting world-class talent. They have the funding. We are on the cusp of big changes when it comes to institutions of science because they're changing and the situation is good. It's positive. But a lot more needs to be done. The efforts need to be scaled up much further. Many thanks to all my distinguished panelists for joining me. That's it on the Science and Society debate on the Infosys Awards show where we've been talking about the Infosys Awards and how they can build talent in the pure sciences and the social sciences. Thanks for watching.